No, but I, I, was, I was going through, my mum was there for me, do you know what I mean? They both ended up mentally scarred. You know, like, I don't think there's been a female in my life that has not been mentally scarred. Looking, what a shit my dad. I loved the ground he walked on. And I wanted to be just like my dad. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's mad. Because I was plugged into the major importers around the world and the major drug barons, gangsters and villains, I grew to that status as well. Well, welcome back to another episode of Marvin Herbert's Nothing But The Truth. We're in new surroundings in the old Moose Bar, new location, and those who know know, and those who don't know will get to know. So, when you're invited to this luxurious space of mine to do the podcast, you'll experience the ambience of the Moose Bar. But today we're going to kick off with um, just a simple conversation with part of my team. Christina, for those who don't know, what's your um, Instagram name? Instagram name, yeah. Um, it's Shine City Superwoman, so I'm technically the superwoman of the team. So, yeah. Superwoman, Shine <laughs> City Superwoman. Check her out, check out Shine City, part of my production team, and uh, we're striving to bigger and better things, changing the narrative. And uh, today, Christina, I believe you'd like to ask me some questions. Yes. Okay, so today's going to be uh, questions and answers from uh, obviously Christina and many other people that have written in on all sorts, but nothing but the truth for what uh, is what we say. So let's get on with it. Sure and way. Okay, so I basically want to start off, I want to speak about the women in your life. So knowing the life that you lived and what you've encountered to get to where you got to, I want to know your opinion on how it may have affected them in your life. So, for example, your mum, your daughters, sisters, um, female friends, um, how, that, how that may have affected them in their life. Is that spouses and partners That's included? Women. Yeah, all women in your life. You can start with your mum first, if you like. I wouldn't have. But as soon as you want to, we will. So, how my life affected my mum? I don't really know because if I'm being honest, I'm more like my mum than I am my dad. Okay. And my mum was unscrupulous, fearless, like go get them. Like she provided what she could for us. She'd done what she could with four kids under the influence of substances. Uh, she'd done her very best, like, she grafted. And there wasn't any other woman on the planet I was scared of. It could have affected my mum in a, what do you call it, way, in, a, in an emotional way where she was fearful I'd be killed. But I think my mum's one of them women that she's always known I'm all right. Like she's one who encouraged me to be the spiritual being I am. So my mum's had a belief that I'm all right. I've never had, like, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult question for me to answer. Like, Emotionally, I know if I died, my mum would be heartbroken. She'd be destroyed. I know that, I know that, I know that. But I think my mum knows I'm equipped to deal with anything. So I don't think my actions or my life really affected my mum until she thought I was dead. So she'd done a little 10-minute um, clip for the channel on when she heard I was dead, and she said she had this, she had this noise, this, and she didn't know it come from in her. Like she just heard a noise, and. And then she realised it was her and she don't know where it come from. She was, she said the pain that she felt at that moment just was indescribable. So the effects that it had on my mum was the same as any other mother. But my everyday life, I'll have to ask my mum that. I was going to say, have you had a conversation with your mum since? Do you know what? Your transition. Do you want to give her a call? Yeah, so yeah, she's going to see, that's what I'm saying. Give like, her a call. Just see. Because it's the only way to find out, because I really don't know. Yeah, not too bad, Mum. I'm just in the middle of a podcast, right? And, yeah. I, and I've been asked a question. 
yeah, that, that how did my lifestyle, not the shooting, what? I was, I've was i been asked a question, Yeah. how did my, not the shooting, not that part of my life, but the, the life and, right, if you listen, I'll tell you, mum, just listen, right, how did, not, don't think about the shooting, just think, how did my life affect you when I was growing up as a mum? I don't, I don't see, I'm just asking. Going into um, Belsom and all of that. It's just like stress. Yeah. Not knowing if you were going to go to jail or blah, blah, blah. Okay. And it got worse as you'd entered the prison system and you were only fucking junior and you were put in Bristol and. You know what I mean? It's yeah. of stress. How did you cope with the stress? I lost a lot of weight. When you, when you, all that was going on. Yeah. Bullying, yeah. Yeah, because it's what we don't realise is the, the sons, right? We don't realise the effects that it had on people. Like, I never thought it affected you. Of course it affected me. I was your fucking mother. I'm still your mother. <laughs> of course it affected me. I know, but you know what I said? You know, when they asked me, I said, you know what? My mum thought I was as tough as now. She wouldn't have been affected. She knows I'm sweet as a nut. That's how I see him. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, I love course. you, I love you, I love you. Yeah, you. Yeah, I was there. Hi, 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 mum. Hi, mum, can I just, hey, hey. I've been traveling prison all over England, We're gonna meet you very soon, I'm looking forward to it, trust me. <laughs> I guess, I guess have a, I just have a, well, mainly one question, I just wanted to ask, how did you cope with the stress? You said that you was very um, stressed and it effect. How did you cope with the effects? How did you handle it day to day? I have no idea. I can't remember. You just took it day to day. I came to it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Make sure I was there. Would you have any advice for any mothers um, out there at the moment with sons um, that are just on this journey? Just to support them, just to support your kids all the way. Yeah. Even through the system. If that's a road you chose, then you follow them because if you've gone a different way and they followed them the same way, I'm forced to. Yo, the mad thing about it, you don't see it like that when you're growing up. You just stick by them. No matter what. It's called unconditional love. I like that, Mum. That's true, though, because. Even like me and my mum was best mates, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. she was my best mate growing up. Like, <laughs> I've got to tell this story, mum. I've got to tell this story, mum, right? So, we're in scrubs, right? The whole jail has been locked down. They found the gun in the jail, right? The whole jail has been locked down. My mum turned up with my auntie, right, to visit me, yeah? And got in the prison. And I had to visit. I was the only man in the prison on the visit, and I got a beer puff. <laughs> How did you get in, Mum? I don't know. I can't remember, but it didn't be mouth, wasn't it? No, I'm talking about how did you get into the prison, you know? Uh, when? when? When you come to the prison and it was a lockdown. I just demanded me, right? Because I had a beer. Yeah. And I, I wasn't moving. Yeah. Until I saw my son and made sure you were all right. How long would you say, on average, it took you until you, until they put their hands up and said, "Okay, come in"? I, I can't remember. It wouldn't have been, it, was, it was in time for a visit. Yeah. She turned up for a visit one thirty, and before the end of the visit, so I had a visit. Okay. And I walked down yeah. to the, I walked down to the visit hall, and there's a hundred screws in the room. And I was like, it's ready, it's ready. All right, lad, I was like, how'd you get in here? She was like, I'm in here. She was like, I've got that thing in my mouth if you want it. I went, yeah, sweet, go on. And she went, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> what a blinder. What a blinder. But yeah, my mum done everything for me, man. She done, like, she was, she was like my right arm. Do you know what I mean? My right arm. And I never saw it as support. Do you know what I mean? I never saw it as supporting me. And it was only until she just said that, just said it really made me emotional. Like, she never gave up on me, mm. ever. No matter where I was or what I was going through, my mum was there for me, do you know what I mean? Like, she was there. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, my dad was a bat, but he was never there. Do you know what I mean? My he mum was, was there. there. He was never there. He was with another woman. Do you know what I mean? He was all, my mum was always there. Do you know what I mean? Crazy. All right then, mum. All right, well, I'll be up to see you soon, mum. Oh, I love you lots. I'll speak soon. Bye. Okay, Bye-bye, mum. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bob, I was hardcore, mate. I'll tell you, she's, she's sick. She's sick. Like, even one of my, one of my sisters got, not, not nonce, but one of the boys, we were living in Corfu. Um, some kid, one of the tough kids around the flats, like, so the same principle around the flats, but around the beach. Mm -hmm. Put his hand down my sister's front part. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And my sister come home and said, some boys just touched her nunny. Mm -hmm. And my mum was like, what? Mum jumped up, run around there, and he was like, I don't know, 15 or 16 kids standing there and they're on their little mopeds. So I almost went up to the biggest one and said, you want to touch my daughter? She grabbed him by the side of the head and just smashed his face up, busted his nose up, mate. Dragged him off the bike, dragged him away and the guy threw him on the floor, turned around and said, come on. And they all spat off, do you know what I mean? Like, my mum, I remember my mum knocked my dad out. Do you know what I mean? Like, my mum was there for me. Like, in that time of madness and craziness in my world, like, my mum was there. Yeah, she was always there. She was always there. That brings me to ask you about your sister. Your sister. Which one? Both of them. Um, well, my eldest sister, I'm kind of responsible for half ruining her. In what way? Because I never accepted her because of certain behaviour and I sort of I suppose the easiest way to put it was, she never lived up to my expectations. She never lived up to my expectations when I was insane and I just abused her and just expelled her from my life. I refused to speak to her for over 12 years. And the only time I started speaking to her was when she got over cancer. The only time I started speaking to her was when she got over cancer. But I traumatised my older sister and my younger sister, she was kind of obsessed with my behaviour and conduct to the point where she always tried to replace or be with people that were similar to me until she met her husband who was principally and mentally the same but not as violent or vicious or crooked. He was a straight guy. He's, 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 like me and him have got so much in common. Um, we clash a lot because I was always that angry, aggressive gangster where he's a straight guy, a worker man. He's an absolute phenomenal dad. He's a phenomenal human being and I respect Mike Cullum ever so much. So would you Michael say- Michael Cullum his name is. But he's, he's my brother-in-law. Me and him really don't speak any longer because me and my younger sister fell out at my dad's funeral, sadly enough. But um, that's a bridge we'll have to cross when we get there. And hopefully, I'll put my hands out a few times, but she's refusing to speak to me because I sort of, what did I do? I sort of grabbed her and bit her cheek. I, I was, I was gonna, you know, when I was that angry, I wanted to just bite a lump out of her face, but I sort of pulled myself back and there's no excuse for doing what I've done. Yeah, it's disgusting. I shouldn't have done it. And it's something I've regretted since I've done it, you know, and I should never have done it. No matter what reason I put to it, I shouldn't have done that. But I reacted badly in a situation that I never had any control of because of my emotional content at that time and the way I was feeling. So would you say your older sister and your younger sister was basically at either end? So one was pulling away, yeah. the other one was pulling towards yeah. you? And they both ended up mentally scarred. You know, like, I don't think there's been a female in my life that has not been mentally scarred. I was never physical, I never beat women up. 
Like, I, I, I'm nothing but the truth. So, in the 42 years of my life, the worst thing I've ever done to a female, I think was in school, and I'm mortally embarrassed now for that, but I put a cigarette out on a, on a girl's face, Lorraine. Is there any reason why you did it? Um, or what, what did you add to that? Well, basically what it was, we were brought up in a time where it was okay to call people black bastard and black cunt and nigger, yeah. right? It was acceptable, but not to black people but it was acceptable within society. So the kids was getting brought up, black country nigger and everybody off, but I was very hostile and very conflictuous. Mm -hmm. And the girl just said something to me one day that was perceived as racist now. Mm -hmm. And I put a fire out on her face, down to it. Um, moving on from that, mm -hmm. I pulled one girl by the hair for calling me another racist name when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I busted a girl's head open with a baseball bat by accident. Like, I was going to say, God rest her soul, she's alive and I've apologised to her. We're on talking terms, we actually do communicate. I won't say who it is, but um, we do communicate. And you can send me a comment just to let everybody know it's really that I'm not talking nonsense. Yeah, um, yeah, but I don't want to mention her name just in case it causes any conflict with her or brings back any whatever. But yeah, and then a dead leg, two dead legs, and these are relationship based now. Okay. So in my relationships, I've given out two dead legs and I regrettably broke a rib, okay? I did break a rib, but not with a punch. I poked my partner, poked right the ribs. Yeah, and it bruised her rib. It wasn't broken, it bruised it. That, and that's all the violent content I've ever displayed in my whole entire life with females. Everything else has just been male driven, you know, so I've never been a wife beater, but the mental capacity of acceptance and accepting my reality. Imagine being in a relationship where you can't ask me what I'm doing. I can't ask me where I'm going. Can't ask where the money's from. You can't, what? What are you talking about? I don't know where the money's from. I don't worry about in the way it affected anybody and made them crazy. And ironically enough, I've never been a cheat. Like, I have slept with other women when I've been in a relationship, right? And the reason why I'd done that was from the excuses that I gave. So when I start entering into relationships, I always said, if I don't, if you don't make me happy, or you create conflict in my life and I'm not around you, then somebody else will replace you. So every female partner has been replaceable, would you say? Everybody is replaceable. Even I'm replaceable. It's not up to me. One of my girlfriends told me that I want to be with no more. Mm. I had to go on with my life, and I got on with my life. Mm. When I got on with my life, they didn't like the fact that I got on with my life, so they wanted me back, and it caused conflict since then. So one of my other partners I didn't want to be with, and. They wanted to be with me and that caused conflict and that went on even up to today. So the conflict's always there once the emotional damage is there, the mental damage is there, you know, and I'm not blaming anyone for anything because it's my insanity which drove them stakes home. So I am responsible for the damage that I caused because of my choices, my life choices, my principles, my morals and my actions. Now, if I wasn't a criminal, I may have had a better opportunity to have a more harmonious relationship with benefits, without consequence, you know. But because all the females accepted my lifestyle, that in itself created conflict because, ironically enough, none of them realised and I don't want to say this cliche or egotistical, but none of them realised who I was mm. and how big I was or how big I could become. So I mean, like, 
always knew I weren't scared of no one. I always knew I'm prepared to steal that. I'm to, prepared to take that. I'm prepared to do this. I knew what I'm prepared to do. So I knew if there's a million pound there and you're stopping me taking it, you're going and I'm taking it. Simple. Right? I don't care what's in front of that million pound, I'm going to take that out of the way and steal it. That was my world, that was my life, that's what I lived on. Now, I used the million pound as, an, as a reference, but I'm not saying I went out and nicked millions of pounds, I'm just saying that. That example is the amount of money that's there. You just, to me, I was always nicking, going to be nicking millions. Unfortunately, the millions never come. No, it wasn't. People, look, you caught up in a mythological world that you're going to earn millions and you're going to get millions. So you aim for millions, mm -hmm. right? And then you settle with hundreds of thousands and then you keep building and chipping away and then you get to the millions and realise it ain't worth it. Mm -hmm. That's what happened with me. And my journey, I was so focused on achieving that goal that I never considered the emotional damage I was causing to the females around me that was not criminals, that grew up with everything. Like my missus used to make a big song and dance about Christmas, but I fucking hate Christmas. Not because of Christmas, just because of my experiences, and my mindset. Like it just brings back sad times. Do you know what I mean, like I just, I just don't like it. So, um. The only time I enjoyed Christmas when my kids were small. The minute my kids got to a certain age, Christmas was back to shit again. Do you know what I mean? But before kids find out about Santa, Christmas is excellent. You know? It's crazy. That actually brings you to go forward to your children. You have daughters, right? Yeah. How many daughters do you have? Three. You have three daughters. Tegan, Marley and Sloan. What's their ages, if you don't mind? Um, Tegan's 22, Marley's 14, Sloan 13 in September. Right. So that they're all at that age where they they can go on the internet and they can not just see yourself but likewise characters of yourself, right? Yeah. So I want to know when you was in that journey of your life back then, how has it affected your female daughters, your daughters? Well, my eldest one, um, I suppose she. I can only give you my opinion. So she's very much similar to me. There's cool, it's like a, a rose in a bush of thorns. Right. She's, she's in a place where she can't be naturally who she is okay. because of the emotional reflection she gives of me. Right. So because she reminds everybody in her world right. of me, right. she can't act like her. Do you understand? So she's been suppressing who she is and it's caused a few issues for her. But now she's getting better, she's coming back and she's gonna hit the planet like a whirlwind. And I had dinner with her the other night. And we've been speaking, she's gonna be back in the gym. Well, she's back in the gym now. So Kobe's just sort of simmered everyone down and now everyone's waking up again. And everyone's dealt with their demons. Everyone's had their solitude. Everybody's had their time to reflect. And now everybody's coming back, bigger and better. And that's all we can hope for. Did your, again, your past journey ever cause uh, moments of her life where you weren't able to be there for her because you was... Yeah, um, from 19, from 2002 to 2006, mm. she never had me in her life. So I was in prison for four years. years. Four years I've had in her life. Mm. And then after them four years, I wasn't in her life every day because me and my mum split up mm. and she went on her own journey. So she's had a very conflictuous mm. existence for the last 12 years. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's been a challenge for her, but she's, she's strong enough. She's willing enough and she's capable enough okay. to become the best version of her. And Marley and Sloane, they're the youngest. Marley's experimenting with life at the moment, making some, not, they're making some negative choices. I wouldn't say they're all, yeah, they're not bad choices, but they're just experimenting like kids do. You know, she's tried drinking and smoking. I don't know how she's getting on with that because me and I don't really communicate how we used to. But that's only because me and her mum split up. So it's just life, you know, the youngest one, Sloan, she's just, me and 
she just she's in school. She goes boarding school slow. She goes to school, she's gymnastics, she does athletics, um, hockey, cricket, netball, and she's phenomenal. And she's on the swim. I think she's just joined the swim team as well. So Sloane's really, really doing well. Yeah, she is, you know. And then my eldest son, Dane, he's he's an electrician. He had a little wobble around about 14 to 16. Um, and obviously, you know, kids, they all think they know everything, don't they? So he's living his little world in his little bubble, thinking, I don't know what he's doing. But obviously, because he's in my area doing things with naughty kids, I sort of got wind of what he was doing. And I sort of manipulated into a situation where he got sick and tired of it all. And he come to me one day and said, you know what, I'm done with it, Dad. I was like, all right, sweet, what are you going to do? He said, I want to do an electrician's apprenticeship. And I think that was... That was before I got arrested. That was like 2012. Wow. Yeah, 2012, 2013, he um, decided to do that apprenticeship. Now he's working, you know, doing his own thing. Being the man he can be. Me and him haven't got the greatest relationship because he was one that was most affected. Like you talk about women, when my son was the most affected with my choices in every way, abandonment, neglect. Like he don't feel loved, he don't feel like I'm his dad. And this is how I'm made to feel. Um, he's the guy that, he don't really open up or talk. So he don't really know his true feelings. I can only assume things of him, but I've never beaten him. He's had one slap off me when he was four. Um, I've tried to give him everything I've, I could physically, financially and spiritually. I've tried to guide him in the best ways possible, but I suppose it's just that social programming he's got to stay away from his dad. So, so do you feel they also have like pressure on them? Because obviously you've been... No, listen, what you understand is, is, is not, children's pressures come from their mothers. Okay. Right? Explain. Well, Please. I hated my dad mm -hmm. because I believed every single word my mum said about him. Now, although you heard my mum a minute ago, yeah, your dad was always with women. Okay, that's fine, but it didn't mean he never loved me. It didn't mean he didn't care about me. It just mean he didn't want to be with you. Do you understand? So, although mothers are hurt, I understand that, but dads love their kids, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like, they love their kids. Like, I love my kids. Like, even all my pals know. Like, I'd say 99% of my pals would say they wish they could be the dad I am to their kids. Do you know what I mean? And that's, I'm, I'm saying it because it's true. Do you know what I mean? People, there's big men now that say, do you know what? I wouldn't be the dad I was today if it wasn't for you when we were younger. Like the way you used to treat your kids and what you used to do with your kids, that's why I do what I do. Do you know what I mean? Like there's people out there, like big men that come to me and tell me that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I don't try to, I just try to develop a platform and an environment for my kids to have that was totally opposite to what I was brought up with. Do you know what I mean? And the sad thing about that was, I felt being in prison was better than being around them. And it fucking hurts every time I think about that. Because I thought, when I never had nothing yet, and I'm looking at other kids with it, all the toys, all the presents, all the nice clothes, I'm thinking, I'm not leaving my kids like that. I'm not letting my kids think like that. I'm not letting my kids feel like that. Do you know what I mean? There's no way in a million years I'll put my kids through none of that. So I've done what I felt I had to do at that time of my life to provide them with what I went without because I never had it. And that was what made me the man. Because oh, the irony of that kind of statement. I wanted my kids to have all this. Do you understand? <laughs> ah! Right? Right? I wanted my kids to have all this. Right? That's why I want my kids. That's what, that's Because this is where I've been all my life. This is where I've been around my whole life. Do you know what I mean? But I've always wanted my kids to have this. Do you know what I mean? Now they're getting it, Tina. Do you know what I mean? Now they're getting it. So, for me, because I've learned so much on my journey, yeah, I understand why I've had to go through what I've gone through, but if I had a choice, mm -hmm. yeah, if I had a choice, mm -hmm. I would have put all that energy into education. 
and became a, a, a professor of something and the sickest man on the planet of whatever it is I do. Because whatever it is I do, uh, I'm not the sickest man on the podcast platform, but look what I've done in nine months. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, look where I've come in nine months. Like, look where I've come in three years, four years. I got to Downing Street. Do you know what I mean? And not that I thought I was one of the baddest men on the road. I didn't think that. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have to think that. Because I was. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't, I'm not, it's not a fantasy. It's not that if you weren't prepared to kill me, then you weren't as bad as me. And people was prepared to kill me and they never did. Do you know what I mean? So to me, I was validated growing up. I'm the baddest. What, they're bad? I'm going over there. I'm going over there. Where's the bad men? I'm going where the bad men are and I'm saying, what? What? Yeah? Like, and it's what? Are we having ag? Or what have you got? <laughs> what are we doing? What? Do you know what I mean? There's that. And it's all for what? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, it's all for what? Right, so that world we lived in before, the barbaric insanity, was to get my kids exactly where I am now. But the journey and the products that I used to get where I am was wrong and I wouldn't condone it to anybody. And this isn't mine. Do you know what I mean? This is me in an environment that my network has created through the good work that I've done. If I never turned my life around, I would not be in this house. I would not be in this environment. I wouldn't be here. Do you know what I'm saying? But this is the friend and the business network that I've created since I turned straight, right? And because of these people, I can continue to be straight because they've plugged me in at the levels that I feel I need to be at and they're telling me, you're that guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling all my youngsters now, nah, come, come. come. That actually brings me to the last question. What would you advise characters of your nature to help them prevent them? Right, characters of my nature. Mm -hmm. Right, we're conduits. conduits. So I can get you anything. Right. Anything you want, I can get it. Right. Facts. Anything you want. Anything you want doing, mm -hmm. I can get done. Not now, yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> right back then. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want doing, I can get done. Yeah. Anything you want doing, I can get done. And I can get you anything on this planet you want. So you was the, the Europe's plug? The I, was, plug. I was the plug, yeah. plug yeah. For anything. For anything. And whether I liked you, determine whether you got it or not. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then I'll become the conduit for Europe into England. Do you understand? So villains in England would ask me, what are these people like, Marv? Mm. Oh, they're all right now. I like that little mob. Then they'd get work. Mm. If I didn't like them, then they got nothing. Mm. And that's all sorts of different drugs. Mm. I mean, all sorts of different products, all sorts of different stuff, because I made an impact in Europe because I'm a decent human being with clear intentions of helping people. Because that's all I've ever done, Stina. Mm. All my badness was helping people. I bullied the bullies, mm. yeah? I bullied the bullies, yeah? I bullied the bullies, yeah? And I was proud of it, yeah? Proud of it. And they know who they are. <laughs> you know who you are, yeah? Do you know what I mean? Are they, are they bullies? You know you're bullies. I don't need to dress it up. Do you know what I mean? Like, come on. Do you know what I mean? And like I said, right, all the bullies are bullies, right? Yeah. Bullies don't have straighteners. Mm. Now, I'll put the gloves on with anybody, anytime, any place, inbox me. Do you know what I mean? And, and I, it's not, I'm not here to, I'm just saying like, I, I, I won't even need to hurt people. I'll just show them, mate. Just show them what, what it's all about. Do you know what I mean? I've done it a few times, in a few environments. I won't name them, but I've gone into environments, asked people to put the gloves on, and I've embarrassed men. One eye disabled. Do you know what I mean? And it's not that I've embarrassed them, they know they could be embarrassed. Do you know what I mean? And I say, see, I can take liberties with you. You know that? It's like, you, you, you. I've just the short amount of time I spent with you. I've witnessed you be in the gym and like, there was a time when like, you had about 12 kids coming at you, just one after the other, one after the other, in the face, everything. And you were still, come on, come on. And I can see in their faces, just like, bloody hell, like. How? Not even, yeah, how? 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 Yeah. I need to know how. How? Is it just? It's, not, it's just mental, it's just mindset. Mindset. And what is is? Obviously, mindset and experience, right? So, growing up, I was beaten a, very, a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. So, it ain't as bad as any of that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know what it takes to split my skin. I know what it takes to break my nose. 
انا عايز ليه ماسكين انا عايز بقى انا عايز اي بروبلم It was a thing I wanted to test you. Okay. I wanted to see how strong you were. Okay. Yeah, and that was what separated me from everyone else. Okay. I wanted the pain. Yeah. I wanted the stabbings. Yeah. I wanted the shootings. I didn't care if I got shot. And everyone out there, you, no, every, I'm not. I'm, I'm speaking honest because it's nothing but the truth, right? But it was this is the mindset that these kids have got to understand that is going to make them billionaires if they choose a different product. Do you understand? Like this. Fear, fearless attribute, this confidence attribute, this courage, courageous, like this the attributes that CEOs have. Like I've met some of the richest people on the planet. I've, I've been in a billionaire's company, hundreds of million pound company. I've been in a company. So I mean, and we run circles around them psychologically. Yeah. So I mean, like they're kind of dim. They're, they're a whack, one track pony. Like they can own, like I've got people doing investments and head funds and things like that. But they don't know nothing about anything that they don't, that they don't do. Mm. Do you understand? Yeah. Like, do you want to guarantee this? Well, I don't know nothing about that. Mm. But it's a good investment, but I don't know nothing about it, so I'm not prepared to invest in it. You say it's ignorance, though. It's yeah, yeah it's, it's all, everything we don't know is ignorance. That's what ignorance is, a lack of education. Mm. Right, so they're ignorant on their part, and we're ignorant on our part. Mm. But they're ignorant on the part where they're succeeding. Mm. <laughs> we're ignorant on the part where we're creating consequence. Yeah. So there's a slight difference, you know. And this is why I'm trying to change the narrative too. Mm -hmm. You know, and for men out there, the one thing, the one thing, the one thing that I would say to women out there, and we gotta sort of cover this subject, right? Now I was the sickest individual you could ever imagine, or one of the sickest individuals on the planet, right? on, the, on the circuit. And I was the, one of the sickest people on the circuit for one reason, Stina, because I believed everything that come out of my mum's mouth about my dad. So be honest with your kids about their dad, man. Like, don't let your relationship with your bloke ruin their relationship with their son. Like, don't use the kids as tools, man. You're damaging the kids, like, you don't realise the damage I went through, the abandonment issues, the, 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 the belief that my dad didn't love me. And there's hundreds of kids that I know. I know all up and down the country, they're bad mouth their dads. My dad's a pussy, I'm gonna chat to him, I chat to him, I don't chat to him, I don't chat to him. And all different walks of life. I've got Asians, I've got Sikhs, I've got fucking um, Chinese, I've got blacks, whites, Irish, Italian, be the similar, so I understand everybody, I understand, everybody, yeah. everybody, yeah. everybody yeah. But don't like their dads because of what they believe. Mm, from their mums. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now, there's some kids that hate their dad because of what they went through, but mm. my dad battered me mm. till I bled. Mm. My dad burned my hand yeah. over the fire. Mm. My dad weighed me in. Mm. But I never hated my dad. I mm. fucking worshipped my dad. I loved the ground he walked on. And I wanted mm. to be just like my dad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's mad. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, my dad, I felt when he died, he was a good man that made the wrong choices with the wrong products again. And he just got sucked into a world that he couldn't live with. In a way, it was harmonious to his development. And that was it. And it, it's a conflict, conflict, conflict. It breaks a man. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And he ended up being a caretaker. Mm. One of the biggest importers of cannabis in this country. He'd become a caretaker in his old age. Yeah, it, well, it's how mad it is, right? My dad became a caretaker to the point, Chippenham, Chippenham, South Kilburn Estate. My dad was the caretaker on the estate. I was brought up around there. I went on all my badness around there. No one knew it was my dad. That's deep, isn't it? Yeah. When my dad's funeral happened, yeah. yeah, pizza, my brother, yeah, come up to me and said, what are you doing here? I was like, you're talking about my dad, you know? He's like, shut up. Because for years, my dad had been telling all these kids yeah. that my son this, my son that, but uh, no one put two and two together. Wow. No one put two and two together. And my dad's funeral, 2016, South Kilburn people was there saying, what are you doing here, mum? I said, my dad. I was like, shut up. What? Well, I don't know. It was your dad. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's deep. It's deep. And I exited him from my life because I didn't believe a word to come out of his mouth. And then, obviously, 
things add up and everybody's got a part to play in the demise of a family, not just one person, you know, so it's just one of them things in life and every parent goes through, it's just how they deal with it and what choices they make to overcome, you know, so it's just, I love both my parents dearly for what they've done for me, what they put me through and what I achieved because what I said to my dad on his deathbed, I said, you know what, I appreciate more than anything, Dad. Because this was just before I turned my life around as well. This was 2000, I think 2004. No, it wasn't 2016, so I actually turned my life around. And then what I said to him, do you know what I've got to thank you for, Dad? He was like, what? I said, the fact that you, you done to me what I needed doing to survive the journey that I was on. Explain that. Well, my, I, don't, I don't know how my dad beat me the way he did. I don't know what possessed him to do what he'd done to me. Mm -hmm. I was the only one in my family that got that level of abuse. Yeah, yeah. My brother got one beating that I remember, my oldest brother Barry, he got one beating with a broomstick that I remember. But apart from that, I got it like fisty cuffs, proper fisty cuffs, regular. Like Rowley Way is one of the longest estates in Europe, right? My dad punched my head in I like, held me by my afro, bigger than it is now, by my afro, punching me in my face all the way down the estate, punching me, kicking me, and because he could play football and box, he could run. So anytime I get away from me, he'd chase me, catch me, bit, and I was just non stop. And then I'd get in, I'd get beaten when I got in, then I'd get the belt when I got in. Do you know what I mean? Because I wouldn't cry, and I was always trying to get away, and I'd call him a cunt and a bastard, I'd get it even harder. And I would never give in to him, and I think that, them beatings, sort of moulded the man I needed to be to deal with all the trauma that was going to be thrown my way in life. Mm -hmm. How old was you when he stopped? 14. 14. And I laugh. Because my dad was a, a, a known member. People knew my dad. People respected my dad because he was a plug. My dad could get shit. Do you know what I mean? He was only, he was only a weed man but he could get lots of it and lots of it, you know what I mean, and weed and ash, and he could get lots of it. Like, they'd do, I don't know, I used to see black bags, black bin liners, full up with five pound drawers. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's how they used to sit and just chop everything up for carnival and things like that. They run shit, they done shit, they like, he was a busy member, do you know what I mean? Like, and I've actually been there when, all the money's getting counted and put in cigarette boxes and sent back to Jamaica or sent back to Barbados or sent back to Africa because there's three places they got their gear from, do you know what I mean? And I remember, because I remember we used, to, we used to have to get the tea chests. My mum is, yeah, I, was, I remember it all that. Like, obviously now I know why we used to do it, yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? I could never understand, why are you buying tea chests all the time? What are these fucking tea chests for? And then the, the fag boxes, they used to put the fag, all the money in the fag boxes and then seal the fag boxes up. Mm. So they put the same weight in yeah, each yeah, box. Yeah, yeah. yeah, weigh all the boxes. So 200 weighed a certain amount. And then they'd fill 5,000 packet boxes up <coughs> and then transport money back in snap. Do you know what I mean? It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, that's, wow. it's just, well, that, that's what they used to do. I, I've, that's, well, that's what I used to see them doing, yeah. filling fag boxes up with money. Like, I just never understood it as a kid, but now it makes sense how they get all the money back to certain places back then. <coughs> Those loads of little things. So would you say you're thankful now? For I'm thankful for everything in my life. Yeah. Even all my trauma. <sighs> Excuse me, because the trauma's taught me how to be the man I am today. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The trauma's actually taught me how to be the man I am today. And without the trauma, I would have just been that insane, barbaric lunatic. Mm -hmm. And my nickname was Mad Marv. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Because... <coughs> Just as Eminem, because my name was Eminem, innit? Okay, Eminem. Cause, no, because M and M. M yeah. Because my real name mm -hmm. is Marvin Mahoney. Okay. Right, so everyone that knows me as Marvin Mahoney knows Scarce Marv, right? Because I was known as Scarce Marv when I first came to London, because I had a Scarce accent, right? So uh, everyone used to, uh, my name was Eminem, 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 Eminem. That's what I had, late 80s, early 90s, and then Eminem came out. So I thought, rah. So I had to change it, and everyone just called, everyone just called him, what's MM? Oh, that's Mad Marv. Mad Marv, Mad Marv. And it just went out as Mad Marv then. 
Do you know what I mean? And then it, it grew into Dirty Marv from Camden, Dirty Marv from North, Big Marv from Spain. Do you know what I mean? So as you grow, your name grows, and then yeah. your network grows, your name grows. So because I was plugged into the major importers around the world and the major drug barons, gangsters and villains, I grew to that status as well. And all I was is a, a little boy from the plot trying to make a difference to achieve all of this. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm on course for getting it when my kids are old. My kids are going to be living in the East States, you know what I mean? Like, it's not for me, I'm just getting them there. I'm leading them to the water. Yeah. Yeah, I'm creating a legacy for them to live in and, and live on and carry on. And maybe they'll all forgive me once their kids are. And their grandkids. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's when I'm going to be getting the gratitude. I mean, I'll be getting, like, every Christmas there'll be dues for me because of what the family are going through and what they've got. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, that's what I'm ex aspiring, aspiring to achieve. To achieve do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's where I'm going, you know. I want to change the direction of my bloodline. And that's it. Simple. What can you tell to the females out there? Um, for example, the mothers with sons that are going through, the daughters. It's, 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 right, it's, it's kind of hard, right? Find out your child's passion and then contact me. Marvin at themarvinherbert.com right? Herbert.marvin on Instagram. Like, I can't do absolutely everything for everyone, but I can signpost you in the right direction. I can place you in the right place, as long as you've got an insurmountable, and which means an uh, unbreakable work ethic. And as you're prepared to work harder than you are to have fun, then I can help you. Because your fun will come later in life once you've achieved your goals. But achieving your goal is hard work, determination, commitment, and a work ethic that's insurmountable. You know? And on closing, like, I'd like just to say, right, that I'm not blaming anybody for what I've been through and what I've done. I'm not blaming anybody for the consequences that I've lived through, right? But all you mothers out there, right, know this. Every great man come out of a woman. Every great man learn what he knows from his mum. Every great man does nothing but love his mother. Every great man has learned how to be the man he is that day because of his mum. The father, has a contributing factor, but the mother is there every day in 99.9% .9 of the cases. Yeah, so I've come to a realization that women are the most powerful of our species and they need a little bit more give and control because from my perspective and my perception, if women run the world, I do solemnly believe we would be in a better place. And I believe we've all been programmed to believe that women are weaker than men, yeah? So men can control the planet and create all this chaos and mayhem. Because how can a mother ruin the planet? How can a father be a mother? Mother Nature, Mother Earth, and all of a sudden all the mothers are getting told you're not stronger than us. Nah. <laughs> Ironically enough, yeah. I don't know how to say this without sounding crude or offensive, right? Right, physically, right, physically, a man, and right, me, me, I'm telling you that, me, me, yeah. I've put parcels up my rectum in prison, right, but I could not imagine the pain that I would be in if a baby come out of my bottom. I couldn't imagine that, but I'm telling you that. I had nine ounces of puff 
and a mobile phone and a bit of white and a bit of brown up my bum and it ripped me to pieces to the point where I was in pain for days and weeks, right? And that was because I was in prison, I wanted the parcel, right? So that was about that big. That was about that big, all in total, right? In bits and pieces. Now, if a man could take a hiding or the physical abuse in his anus that a woman takes in her vagina, yeah, I'll hold my hands up and say we're weak, but come on. You can't do to a bottom what men do to vaginas. And over and over again. Every day, for years. And what does a woman do? They love you for that. They love you for that. So when you weigh up the positives and the negatives, me, I'm not saying men are the weakest physically, but come on, the women are the most durable of the species, right? They're the most committed of the species. They're the most loyal of the species, right? And they are, like, and men are always begging. Yeah, come on, you know, we're always begging, grafting, like, we fuck up all the time. Women, occasionally, I'm not saying they're as bad as us, they do do it occasionally, but with reason. There's only a very, 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 very small percentage of women that do bad shit, right? So I'm not saying women are angels and women are saints and men are this and men are that. What I'm saying to you is, yeah, women are the most durable of our species, physically and mentally. Now, because of societies suppressing the females' sort of opportunities, sort of everything, they just suppress them mentally, physically, every, everything, right? And it's no race, it's just women. And all the jokes about women, all the scenarios about women, like, this is something I feel powerful about because I don't, I don't know where I'd be without my mum. I know where I've been without my dad, do you know what I mean? But I don't know where I'd be without my mum. Do you understand? 100%, yeah. Where would you be without your mum? I mean, I understand the 2% of you out there. There are a few of me with your mum. I can't really voice my opinion or sort of, I can't have empathy with that because I haven't, I've had my mum. But my dad, so I know what it's like not to have a dad. Do you know what I mean? There are those pastors out there that haven't had a dad, but... Mumsy, man. Mumsy, what we do about mum? Yeah, damn. And my mum was rago. Yeah, my mum would bring me my puff, my sniff, and my graft. I used to give my mum puff. She didn't even know what she was bringing into jail sometimes. Do you know what I'm saying? But she done it because of her love for her son. Yeah, although she knew it was bad, she knew I needed to survive because she knew I was paying for my kids. So I mean, I need my graft, mum. I need it. Like, and my mum was there, rago. A cat, B cat, C cat. My mum was there. How would you think would have been <coughs> if she wasn't as supportive or if she wasn't there? I would have been ten times worse. Because mm. my mum made me spiritual. The spiritual aspect of Marvin Herbert comes from Anne Mahoney. Okay. A.K.A. Murray, yeah. Yeah. My mum. My mum's the one who's given me all my confidence. I mean, my dad made me believe in who I am because I took his power. Mm. I could take his beating. I, could, I wouldn't cry in front of my dad. He could beat me with a belt until I bled and I wouldn't cry. I'd say, you're a mug, you're a mug, you're a mug, you're a mug, you're a mug. What? Go on then, go on then, don't know, don't know, don't know. And then when he went, I'd cry. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes, he made me cry when he hit me with a buckle once. Like, he made me cry when he hit me with a buckle. He made me cry when he burnt my hand. Do you know what I mean? And I still couldn't do that to my son. You know? And my son's the only person that's really broke my heart as well. Because I don't think he appreciates my struggle. And he really doesn't. You think he understands? No, 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 he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't. He knows his mum's done some bad things to me as well. And it wasn't like I was bad to his mum. His mum was bad to me. To the point where I couldn't be with her. Do you know what I'm saying? I couldn't be with her. I couldn't be with her. Do you know what I mean? And she's explained to him why. And he's accepted it. But I'm still the bad guy. 
So me and him haven't spoken now for a good few months. Ironically, since his mum got a new boyfriend. Yeah, I'm going to put it out there because it was alleged, it was alleged, yes, that I went round to her new boyfriend's home or ex-home where he lived with his ex-partner and told his ex-partner some profanities about my ex-partner and I don't know, but it never happened. I didn't even know she had a new boyfriend. So, I mean, all I heard was I've been cutting the life out of her and I was like, to who? I haven't even spoken about her. And then I rang up and said, why are you trying to spread malicious rumours about me? I don't give a fuck who you're with or what you're doing. Like, good luck to you. If you're happy, good luck. Do you know what I mean? And I rang my son to explain to him. I asked him to bring me back. And he hasn't rung me since. I spoke to my daughter every Christmas, every birthday. Every day I rang my kids. Every Christmas, every birthday, my pals turned up on their front doorstep with parcels. Yeah? Of presents and money. Yeah? They got everything I felt they needed as a child. I got told their dad don't love them when I was sitting in prison, because that was the only way for me to make money at that stage. Do you know what I mean? Like, I used to leave my ass prepared to commit an armed robbery with enough drugs inside me for if I get nicked so I can send money home. So my backup plan was always risking my liberty again to make sure my kids ate. I know what it's like not to eat. I know what it's like to open your cupboard, there's no food in there. Like, no food in there. Open my fridge, there's no, there's no food in there. I don't want my kids living like that. So that's why I've done what I've done. And there's no excuse for doing what I'm doing. I was just ignorant, uneducated, and very angry, yeah. And I've done what I felt was best, but it wasn't. But it got me where I am today, so I'm thankful that I was resilient enough to make it out the other side and be able to communicate on the level that I do, Stina. I'll talk about my dirty washing. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, because it's the only way for people to learn. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no one understands. And it's like, we're going to bring something to you now. So I'm going to bring some really, really wealthy children. So wealthy families have got children. But because of the circles I'm moving in now, I've approached them and asked them if they'll come on my podcast to talk about the issues that they have, the, um, the problems that they have, um, the reality that they face, the pressures that they face, and everyone thinks just because you've got money you're happy, mm -hmm. you know, but money doesn't bring happiness. And I want to prove money doesn't bring happiness. Do you understand? I'm living proof. I had all the money in the world, but I was never happy. Chasing my tail. Do you know I mean? A lot of people out there think money's going to change everything. No, it doesn't. Why do you think rich people get depression? Why do you think rich people end up in drug clinics? Why do you think rich people kill themselves? Do you understand? Because they're not happy. Money doesn't bring happiness. Money just brings a higher sense of responsibility. A higher sense of responsibility. That's what money brings. Okay? It's a higher sense of responsibility. And you've got to use that money to help grow or perpetuate the species. Two simple facts. So unless you're growing, money's pointless. And I'm a living proof of that. How would you have a hundred and nine million pound turnover and have no money? It's crazy. It's crazy. And I'm not even exaggerating. That's not a lot of drugs either. That's 20, 50 and 500. 20, 50 and 500 bits of puff. Do you know what I mean? Come on. It's not even a joke. Like half a ton of cannabis isn't, isn't, isn't that much gear to have. People just don't get it. So that's what I'm bringing to the forefront of everybody's mind. That it's easier just to work hard, communicate clearly, and get the job done. And it works. I'm living proof. If I can do it, if I can make it to Downing Street, Stina, for fuck's sake. Everyone can make it. Anyone can make it. How can I get to Downing Street? How? How can I get invited to speak to teachers in schools and colleges? How can I walk around the prison with, with keys? and no screws. My mate walks me around the prison. We go and get kids out of cells and go in the room and sit down and talk to them. Do you know what I mean? Do you understand? Like, that's the responsibility I have now. That's the respect I've got now. That's the man I am today. You know, so if you think it's not possible, think again. Yeah? If you're thinking about staying in crime, just ask yourself, for what? For what? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a joke. It's a 
if it wasn't a joke, I'd condone it. You know, but facts. Two percent of the criminal fraternity are successful. The rest of them are chasing the tower and living the mythological dream that won't amount to nothing but prison, death and problems. And that's a fact. You know what I mean? Hmm.